Welcome to Startup Health Now, the weekly webcast that celebrates the healthcare transformers and change makers reimagining healthcare. My name is Unity Stokes, and today we have a very special guest, Susanna Fox, who is the CTO of Health and Human Services. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. Well, I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to those who take it. All right. So welcome back. Welcome, Suzanne. It's wonderful to have you here. And uh, congratulations on your new role as, as CTO of HHS. Thanks. Um, just to kick things off, you know, we know what a CTO, Chief Technology Officer, is in startup land and, and in corporate world, industry world. What does a CTO do? What's the role like within government? Well, it's different for different agencies. At okay. HHS, the CTO is really um, the chief innovation officer. Mm -hmm. My role is to look not at how technology and healthcare are intersecting today, but look about five years out and sort of bring back reports from the front, you know, okay. and, and look at the future and bring, bring that back and help the secretary and the leadership better understand and build towards where we're going. The role is also like entrepreneur in residence, where we're constantly trying to start small pilots that if they're successful, we spin them out and let them go free. Um, and so it's almost like you're building a startup within yes. government in a lot of ways. Yeah, so, it's an, so I run an innovation lab, which really is like a startup, and we're highly leveraged. Uh, we have a small staff, but we, we bring a lot of people in um, from outside government and inside HHS. Um, and run quite a few programs that, uh, what we hope, really um, help to create innovation at HHS because what we're dealing with are problems that are new every day mm -hmm. and are re a huge challenge for the government and a huge challenge for the world. And we can't do things the way we always have. And so what we try to do is um, experiment. Mm -hmm. And if those experiments are successful, so why did you uh, why did you decide to serve and you know I know it's a big decision to to sort of take this tour of duty that you're doing it's it's hard work and uh, what what sort of drove you to to make the decision and take the leap? Well, to be honest, it's when you get a call from someone like Todd Park and right. Ryan Sivak, you can't say no. In fact, I did say no at first, and, and they were persistent, and um, I said no, no. no. I'm going to go work for a startup company. I'm having too much fun. I'm, I'm uh, really enjoying being on the outside. And they said, that's exactly why we need you. We need people within HHS who don't necessarily think like someone who is a federal worker to bring that startup mentality, to bring that entrepreneurial spirit mm. into the government. And honestly, I have spent so much time in patient communities over the last 15 years. I feel a real sense of responsibility for bringing that voice into the work that HHS does. And I'm happy to say that there are many, many people who share that passion of mine, including the secretary. So mm. Secretary Burwell often opens meetings with a story of one patient who has benefited from the services that HHS provides. Because that's what it really comes back to individual stories and, and to people that um, the government's trying to help, and I think the whole industry is trying to help. These are real people with real stories and, and real health issues. Yeah, and, and I also just have to say that the more I thought about it, the more I realized I have such a crush on democracy. I really have a crush on government and on our country, and the idea of being able to serve, I couldn't resist. Yeah, you know, I, I, a lot of people think about serving their country in terms of maybe joining the military, mm -hmm. um, but there's so many other ways to serve. Um, and, and I think one thing that I hope we can do is inspire more entrepreneurs to um, serve their country and, and specifically in healthcare because there's a lot of, of work to be done. Um, what are some of the things you mentioned this innovation lab? You have 
um, the idea lab that you started. Um, what are some of your priorities? Um, and maybe we can dig into how maybe the entrepreneurial community can, can support those priorities. Great. So um, we divide our work into three areas. One area is bringing in outside talent. Um, and that's the Entrepreneur in Residence Program and Innovator in Residence Program. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we also leverage internal talent. So we try to build up the entrepreneurial skills and design thinking skills of people who have already devoted themselves to public service. And so we run an Ignite Accelerator program. Which so these are of, people that have been in government yeah. for maybe years? or Yeah, and, and um, what I love is, is that um, the government is very hierarchical. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the best ideas come from someone way down deep in the hierarchy. And what we try to do is open windows and open doors so that someone who has an idea can gain the skills, get a little bit of air cover, um, and, uh, and, and just try. Try to create a pilot. Um, and then if they're successful in their pilot in the Ignite Accelerator program, we have a ventures fund um, to then give them a little bit more money, a little bit more support to try and spin that out. And we've had some really great successful projects, like one of my favorites is the NIH 3D Print Exchange. Um, so that if you're interested in 3D printing and health, then check out the NIH 3D Print Exchange, which went through our Ignite Accelerator program and then now has been funded by the Ventures Fund. So is this, you know, what I guess surprised you most, you know, you're six months into your, your tenure, um, were you expecting it to be this entrepreneurial or, or is it because of this generation of, I guess, innovators and entrepreneurs that are coming to government that are creating these things? What, what surprised you most and, and well, where are things going? I've lived in D.C. a long time, and, um, and so the idea of innovation in public service wasn't shocking to me because some of the people I know who are really the most innovative are people who are already working for the government. And to see that change could happen at scale is really extraordinary. Um, and I think that the Obama administration in particular in embracing technology and embracing what really is a customer service ethic, mm. which I think is at the core of being a good entrepreneur, I think that that ethic and that motivation is um, true throughout the federal government, um, but particularly at HHS because of the history that we've had with Todd Park and then Brian Civic as CTO. So you, you mentioned um, Todd Park and Brian, and you know I know they're, one of the amazing things that we've been inspired by at Startup Health is, is the data liberation movement. Um, can you touch on that, maybe sort of the state of that, where things are, and maybe where things are going with, um, with that movement, and then we'll, we'll jump back to um, this Entrepreneur in Residence program. Cool, so the um, Building Communities of Practice is actually our third area of interest. And um, when, when Todd Park came into the government as the first CTO at HHS, he saw all of the data that was sort of um, lying fallow and mm -hmm. not really being leveraged within HHS, all across all our operating divisions. And so he saw the opportunity to free that data and to make it available for anybody. And at that time, we didn't really know what was going to happen. And so it really was a classic pilot. And um, what we found is that lots of people use the data. Entrepreneurs use the data. Um, uh, big insurance companies use the data. Actually, government workers are, are one of our top users of the data. And so that is an example of something that's really spun out the Health Data Initiative, healthdata.gov, and our, the annual conference, the Health Data Palooza, showcasing all the stuff that can go on when the data is available. Mm. Um, so the, the first step is just unleashing the data, unleashing organizing the data. it, and then unleashing it. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and making it machine readable. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're learning is that um, we need to again be more customer service driven. So we need to understand that um, uh, at first, uh, people in government freed the data sets that were the easiest to free, or that they thought people would be the most interested in. And as a community has grown up around the health data, what we're learning is that we need to be even more responsive. We need to listen to the community who is, for example, demanding a certain data set that isn't yet available. Mm -hmm. And so we in the Idea Lab looked at that and we've recruited an entrepreneur in residence 
to create something called the Demand-Driven Open Data Service, where um, people can, instead of using FOIA to say, I want the Freedom of Information Act, I want this particular data set and give it to me personally. What we want to do is create a community around a data set um, so that many people can benefit, because that's really what we're all about. We want to free the data for everyone's benefit. And is that um, sort of the genesis uh, of helpdata.gov, and is that where people should start in terms of sort of uh, being a part of this community? Where, where do people go? Where do entrepreneurs, innovators go to sort of join this community? Yeah, I would check out healthdata.gov. I would also check out um, this ddod.us, the demand driven open data. Because um, what we're trying to do is build case studies so that okay. if you're new to this and you're not really sure how would I use government data, what we try to do is, is create case studies. Um, the HHS Idea Lab blog is also a place where we put up case studies. Um, and you can see how you know, data is fuel. Mm. And in a lot of ways, it's free market research. So if you're trying to go into a certain region of the country, or if you want to help people with a certain condition, it would be powerful to know sort of the outlines of, of what that community really looks like, whether it's a, a regional community or a disease community. And that's the kind of data that we can provide. So if phase one was liberating the data, what's your vision for where you'd like to take things next? I think it has to be more social. I think we have proven that there is an audience for this, that, that, that people are using this data. Um, and what we hope to do is make sure that we're opening the spigots of data all along the pipeline. So opening the data that, that is available at the population level. Mm -hmm. um, we do work also, um, you know, frankly, the focus around the interoperability of electronic health records fits into this because it's all about the data flowing to where it needs to go. And then the work that we're doing with Blue Button, mm -hmm. which is really at the individual level, opening that little spigot for one individual to download their data and then be able to direct it. Um, so at every level, we want the data to flow. We want people to know that it's usable and, and to really sort of create a social life of information around this data. So if you could wave a, a magic wand and, and the entrepreneurial ecosystem would get involved, um, what would your ask be? Um, we've talked about a couple of things. There's this entrepreneur in residence program and then there's um, these case studies or you know, inspiring the industry and, and innovators to start using data and doing interesting things. What would your ask be or what would some of your asks be of the ecosystem at large? Um, one of the areas that we face significant challenges um, is in upgrading legacy uh, databases. So we're currently recruiting for two entrepreneurs in residence for the CDC to um, look at this legacy system that we have that is um, currently working, but we know it could work better, and it's a disease surveillance system. So it's what um, they use at the CDC to track a measles outbreak or Ebola. Mm. So this is of national- This is serious stuff. Really serious stuff, national and international importance, and it's running on legacy systems. So sometimes I love to talk to people who are doing that work for healthcare systems and say, um, wouldn't you like to come and work on a, the biggest puzzle of all? Mm. That's what we work on in government, these really big, hairy problems. And so if you like to solve puzzles and solve problems, then that's what we need you to do. Um, and often I appeal to people's patriotism, that mm -hmm. this really is something, a way for you to serve your country, using the skills that you've honed in the private sector to bring them in just for one year, one year tour of duty in the government, to really contribute to something greater. Um, another reason to do it is actually to understand the U.S. healthcare market. Mm -hmm. Is what better understand. way to yeah, learn? Exactly. Yeah. We're one of the biggest buyers of and providers of healthcare in the U, in the U.S. So where where should people um, apply for this opportunity? Learn more about about it. They 
go to hhs.gov? Yep, hhs.gov slash idealab. Okay. And um, we have an open opportunities page, um, and we're always updating it. So we're currently recruiting for the CDC, um, but we're constantly adding new positions. So you could submit your resume, um, and and we'll keep it, Mm -hmm. um, so that if something comes up that fits your skills, then we'll contact you. So we're calling on all the great entrepreneurs and innovators <laughs> out there to apply and, and serve your country. Are there other ways that entrepreneurs can be serving um, in addition to the Entrepreneur in Residence program? Um, maybe um, by using the data in interesting ways. What other advice would you share with innovators out there on, on things that they could do that would really be additive to, to the solutions and, and problems that we're trying to solve here in healthcare? Well, one of the things that I'm both humbled and inspired by is to realize that the HHS is a federal agency that serves every American from birth to death and everything in between. And um, one of the groups that we're especially concerned about are the underserved. Mm -hmm. And so I think a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs right now is to look at what has technology brought to us in terms of the ability to reach out and connect people with, for example, services. Um, And, uh, you know, so for many years, I tracked the uptake of technology in the US um, at the Pew Research Center. And what we saw was this meteoric rise of cell phones and smartphones. So nine in 10 American adults have a cell phone. And that's true across the board in terms of lower income, lower education, um, younger people especially. How might in entrepreneurs use the idea of cell phones and smartphones to connect people to um, making better healthy food choices, mm-hmm. um, combating um, childhood obesity, which is a significant problem. Um, and we actually just recently ran a challenge um, looking for business plans for innovating for the underserved. And we got some fantastic ideas from that. That's amazing. You know, one of the things I've, I've heard you talk about is, maybe this is part of your accelerator program, um, but you have the the teams make sure that they do, is it 30 or 50 customer <laughs> yes. uh, interactions or, or meetings um, before they get to the next stage. Um, one of the things we're constantly talking to entrepreneurs about is, why not focus on the underserved markets? Yeah. They're, they're in desperate need. Yeah. Um, oftentimes they have more time for entrepreneurs. They're willing to work with entrepreneurs in exciting ways. And I think there's just these, these unique opportunities for collaborations in, in underserved markets. Um, are, there, uh, ele- are, are there any special programs um, that are, maybe it's part of the data sets that are out there um, that entrepreneurs could be leveraging to sort of tap into these uh, underserved markets. I guess my question is, how do people get started? Yeah. Um, how do they even know um, where to go or which markets to, to sort of be helping? Well, I think one, um, one way to look at this is to actually look at the community health centers, for example, mm. and spend time there. Um, and uh, talk to the people who are already on the ground level um, and see what is the possibility, what really are the needs of that certain community. Um, And there is so much opportunity, there really is. It's one of the places where I see a lot of white space Mm -hmm. in healthcare and technology because there aren't many people really serving these communities and there is an opportunity to do that. Um, And so indeed, spending time in the community um, is something that entrepreneurs can do. Um, And it's what we encourage people who are are trying to create new programs within the government. We actually um, force them to create a minimum viable product, to create a prototype, Mm. and actually bring it to the end user. So Mm -hmm. for example, um, there was a hospital, um, part of our Indian Health Service in Phoenix, that wanted to innovate around the emergency room. And at first they came up with the idea of um, you know, speeding up intake by creating a computer kiosk. Well, they brought that to the community and they realized this is, a, this is mostly an older adult population, mm-hmm. not comfortable with computers. And so they had to pivot and create something that's paper-based. They never would have known that unless they had brought their prototype to the community. And most of our teams actually find out that they have to pivot three times mm-hmm. just in the three-month program. 
and and that's yeah. what I love about is it. Is that one of the big challenges where today, where maybe a lot of the the builders aren't necessarily uh, directly familiar with the the true needs or, or some of the true problems? Is that one of the big challenges? And if so, what? Do, Maybe I'm answering my own question. Is the way to solve that by just spending more time in, in these markets, in these communities, and with these people? Absolutely. And that and that's um, a lot of what I did prior to joining the federal government. I um, am an anthropologist who focuses on health and technology. And so what I've always found is that by spending time with patients, with caregivers, especially people living with life-changing diagnoses, um, caregivers, uh, we are going to learn about the future. They're using technology in a way that we can't even imagine. We in sort of the well, pre-disabled community, which mm -hmm. is what I like to call everyone, we're all living pre-disabled. Mm -hmm. We all hope that we're gonna live long enough that we're going to need assistive devices. It's the universal need. I mean, health and well-being impacts every human being on in, on Earth, really. Absolutely, and, and I would add <clears throat> that, that what I think we're really facing in this country is um, a significant challenge with an aging population. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to affect every family, um, rich or poor, but especially looking at the underserved population, about how might we create a way for people to age in place with dignity. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding that market is one way that you could use our data. Um, it's also a way to look at actually the human services side of the Department of Health and Human Services. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the health part kind of sucks up all the oxygen. <laughs> There's, you know, the CDC, the NIH, the FDA, those, those are the sort of big agencies. But then um, there's the Administration for Community Living, ACL, which is looking at older adults and people living with disability. And there is so much opportunity for figuring out how to serve those markets as well. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, a lot of people think about health in terms of themselves or maybe their immediate family. Why should, be, uh, why should people be thinking about the, the needs of, of the broader community, the, the country, even the world in terms of, of, of health and, and well-being? Well, what I think we all hope to do is work on the toughest, biggest impact problems. And um, I think that, I think it's interesting to look at the innovations that are happening essentially for the 1% mm -hmm. of the, you know, the healthy people. Um, but look at the, the broad base of the pyramid, the diversity of issues that people are facing. And, and you could pick, again, one region of the country or one disease or condition state um, or one life stage, for example, looking at caregivers of people living with Alzheimer's and innovate around those issues because I guarantee there's more elbow room there um, mm -hmm. than among you know, the 1% the problems. So wh where do you see us um, in terms of the innovation cycle? I know uh, previously we were talking about this era, of the, the maker era. Um, where do you see us in the innovation cycle and, and where do you hope things are going? So um, I learned this from Ronnie Zeiger, who's the founder of Smart Patients. He describes um, the first two phases of the internet's impact on society. The first phase was connecting documents, mm. and that was really the Google phase. And the second phase, which I think we're in now, but moving slowly out, is the, um, connecting people. And that was kind of the Facebook. Facebook was the dominant um, company of that phase. And now I think we're moving more towards um, a hardware and manufacturing phase where, um, and I started picking this up in my field work that I would go into a patient community and I would be asking them about crowdsourcing and about uh, data and they would say, yes, yes, but look at what I made. Mm. And it would often be something that they had created as an assistive device for their child or um, themselves or for- yeah, Individual people are making their own things with 3D printers now. Absolutely, or... and so what we're seeing is there's so much possibility for patients and caregivers to redesign these medical devices and for the better. Um, and so we see it, for example, in the diabetes community, um, the work that Howard Look at Tidepool is doing 
in, in asking the continuous glucose monitor companies to open up their data to APIs so that people can get the data and then do something with it, and how to improve the actual hardware. Mm. Um, I'm really inspired by a lot of the pockets of innovation that I'm seeing. As manufacturing costs drop, what I'm asking my colleagues in the federal government to do is consider how might we lower the barriers to entry for people to invent our way out of this mm. healthcare crisis that we're facing. And so um, we're going to be launching something called Invent Health. Oh, yeah, and Invent throwing, Health. Yeah, okay. throwing a spotlight on this idea of what can the maker movement teach us in mm. healthcare? What can people who are innovating around um, medical devices and assistive devices teach those of us um, sort of in the in the big buyer space? So does this start with? Um industry with entrepreneurs or go all the way to the individual consumer that can get involved with this? So both um, in a way that what we want to do is um, spark this idea of an innovation nation and that's something um, that Megan Smith, the US CTO, has talked about that we want everyone to feel like they can solve their own problems. Yeah. And we want that in health, too. Yeah. Um, and that's something that also Secretary Burwell has really asked us to think about across the department. How can we engage individuals so that they have access to the right information at the right time to make the best decision for themselves? And I want to expand that to include the hardware of healthcare, mm. um, so that sometimes it's going to be something that you can make, you know, that MacGyver would make, like it's going to be duct tape and coat hangers, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's going to be a prototype or something that gets 3D printed that actually is, you know, a pretty significant prosthetic. We're for, seeing some of this already. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Children making prosthetics and, yeah. and just an extraordinary innovation happening as a result of what you're talking about. Yeah, and so, at the VA, they're, they're, they're actually involving veterans, wounded warriors, in the creation of wow. prosthetics. Wow. And, you know, so that's what we want to see, the, the solving your own problems and doing patient-centered design. So maybe paint a, a picture of, of the future is... Does everyone have their own innovation lab in their <laughs> in their garage and, and they're building things that are personalized to them and, and they're involved in the in the creation process? What I really want to see is the definition of technology broadening to not just be about IT and not just be about electronic health records and not even just about data, hmm. but it's about the whole experience of health. Um, it's about wearables. Um, it's about how to take care of your loved one. Again, how to age in place with dignity. Mm. And that is going to take invention on a scale that we haven't seen yet, but which I have complete confidence that this is part of the American story. The American story is a story of ingenuity. Um, you know, we're descended from Ben Franklin and Thomas Edison mm. and, and other inventors. Um, and that's what I'm really excited about bringing into HHS. It's so exciting to hear. I'm getting getting very excited. So, going to shift gears. Um, a couple of fun questions here, um, personal questions. Uh, kick things off with a little speed round here. Um, do you have a favorite book? A book you find yourself either gifting to people or that's you're reading now that's inspiring you? The book I'm reading now, Peers Inc. by Robin Chase. Um, she was the founder of Zipcar. And what she talks about is there's, um, what she recognized was the excess capacity. And, and she's written this book, which is throwing a spotlight in all kinds of ways. Like Airbnb, basically, is the excess capacity of right. the spare room or spare apartment. And the excess capacity that I see in healthcare is all the knowledge that's shared by patients, mm. but isn't yet feeding up into the clinical system. Uh, so that's the book that I'm reading right now. Oh, fantastic. How about uh, favorite technology or uh, technology you find yourself using all the time? Oh, man. Um, I would, I mean, I'm obsessed with Twitter okay. because for me, it's like having a superpower to be in two places at once. Yeah. And um, you were early on Twitter. You've been <laughs> on for a while. I was. Yeah. And um, it, in a way, it's because I feel like I'm often, I often feel like a unicorn wherever I am, yeah. um, and finding other unicorns, finding other people yeah. 
who want to work in interdisciplinary teams, you can find that online. You can find that at conferences. And now I found it at HHS. Um, but Twitter is my superpower, I would say. That's fantastic. What motivates you? What impact, keeps you going? Impact. Um, I'm really uh, not motivated by money or power. Or um, Somebody asked me a great question. Would I take this job if it didn't have such a great title? Because the title right, of Chief right. Technology Officer is it's a pretty great cool, title. right? Yeah. And I honestly said, yeah, I would take that job if I could have impact. Yeah, fantastic. Last question, how do you stay healthy? I'm a runner um, that uh, actually came about not because I love to run at first, but because uh, I found myself waking up really early um, and didn't have anything to do. I didn't want to wake up anybody. And so I started walking and then I started running. And now I find that it's uh, a form of meditation for right. me. And now I'm addicted. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here, but thank you for your service and, and everything that you're doing. It's My really pleasure. inspiring and, and we love what you guys are doing at HHS and, and love this concept of the innovation nation. This is fantastic. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon.